Okay, let's get started. I want to welcome you to Tuneheim's second virtual panel since COVID-19 has altered the way most of us work and live. We're thinking about all of you, our clients, and those of you joining us today. And here at Tuneheim, we're really valuing opportunities to connect, however that happens, whether it's for through a virtual staff meeting or a virtual happy hour, which are suddenly very popular at our office. Um, but I know you have a lot on your plate and thank you for taking the time to join us today. My name is Luann Olson. And I lead the media practice at Tuneheim. We're an agency built, based in Minneapolis, Minnesota that works with clients um, to help them be better understood by their stakeholders, whether that's their customers, their employees, their suppliers, whoever that is. We customize our approaches. Um, we do a lot of services from public affairs to digital to crisis. And specifically in my media practice, we help our clients tell their stories to media in a way that is both appealing to reporters and also helps our clients um, meet their goals in whatever, whatever they may be. Today, we're so honored to be welcoming a few of the best in the business for this conversation. Our panel will be sharing insights about how their newsrooms have changed the way they're working and how they're choosing stories of the day. I know a lot of you are PR and marketing people who have signed up to be with us today. So I think you'll find this very valuable. Um, and they'll also share their advice for organizations that have stories to tell, whether that's right now or sometime in the future. I wanna remind you, this is a live web conversation. Our panel participants are at the mercy of their Wi-Fi, like all of us right now. And as long as breaking news stays at bay. On the right side of your Zoom screen, you'll see a chat function. And so watch that throughout the um, conversation because Nick, our digital guru, will be posting additional context that will help add to the conversation throughout. Um, we'll also be recording this conversation and sharing it later on Tuneheim social channels. So if you're interested in sharing that with someone later, you can watch that. So let's get right to it and meet our panelists. We are so honored to be welcoming Jamie Yukis from CBS News, Jason DeRussia from WCCO TV, and Allison Kaplan from Twin Cities Business. And um, include where you're joining us from today because it's so nice to see your different backgrounds. Uh, explain a little bit about what your role is at your organization, and then just talk a little bit, give us a little snippet of uh, what COVID-19 has meant for you and how you're doing business. So Jamie, if you don't mind, let's start with you. Welcome. Hi, I'm coming to you from Los Angeles in my kitchen. This is uh, my dining room in uh, Sherman Oaks, if anybody's familiar with the Valley. Um, I am a correspondent for CBS News and it, my dog just uh, got out of bed. She's walking. You might be able to hear her nails clicking in the background on the floor. Um, but yeah, I'm working from home, which is a complete change for me. I, uh, up until March 15th, had spent 32 days away from home. Um, and since March 15th, have now been working primarily from home. They're limiting our time in the Los Angeles Bureau. So we're doing a lot of interviews by Skype. We're meeting crews out in the field with sanitizing and trying to keep that social distancing. Um, but I've had to set up my own little studio here. I don't know if you guys can see my little light microphone, cell phone stand. Um, so that's, it's altered. Uh, usually I have a wonderful crew with me, audio person, photographer who make me look great, sound great. Um, and now I'm trying to do it myself. So um, bear with me. <laughs> and Jason, I think you're next. I am next. Hi, I'm Jason DeRussia. I, uh, I am the morning news anchor at WCCO TV here in Minneapolis. And I have been, uh, uh, solo anchoring our morning news for the most part. Uh, we have been trying at WCCO to get people out of the newsroom. Uh, I'm coming to you from my home right now. I start work at 3.30 in the morning, so uh, this is just about nap time for me normally, but I, uh, uh, my co-anchor has been sent home, so she is uh, working from home. Our traffic anchor is on maternity leave. She would have been sent home anyway, so I've been uh, on mornings where there's traffic, I've been doing the traffic also. 
and uh, our weather anchor has been sent to his home. So I get the pleasure of coming into, you know, German infested central and try not to catch the coronavirus. That is my goal every day. Um, but it's been uh, very, very interesting. We have gone from a newsroom that Jamie can tell you as, as a former WCCO -er, that was relatively backwards from a technology standpoint to producing newscasts with most of our team at home. And we're still working to get even more people to be able to work from home. Um, at the same time, I've been trying to serve as a community resource. So while uh, anchoring our news and doing all of the usual stuff, I've been building kind of a, a my first project was building a website with all of the different uh, restaurants from the Twin Cities that were offering curbside pickup and takeout. And I thought that would be a kind of a minor little list that grew to be 900 plus restaurants in an interactive map. That was quite a project. And now I'm trying to connect people with jobs. So I, I, I'm trying to identify what is the need, how can we serve it, and how can we make sure our viewers feel kind of a sense of normalcy, but also the urgency of the situation, as well as being a resource. So all of those things kind of coming together. Uh, let's send it over to Allie Kaplan. Allie, you're up. Thanks, Jason. Uh, so hi, I'm Allie Kaplan. I'm the editor in chief of Twin Cities Business Magazine here in uh, the Twin Cities coming to you from um, my home office. As you can see, we've put together a post it board for the uh, children to stay on task and they have selected nothing today for their to do. So it's working really well. <laughs> Um, if you hear some noise in my background, it's because my son is doing a, a Rube Goldberg and I told him he needed to be quiet and not be bouncing balls on the hardwood floor, but he is not listening. So <laughs> apologies in advance. Um, for us, a monthly magazine, um, we're sort of living in two worlds where we are doing even more online coverage than we normally do. We've ramped it up exponentially um, just to keep up with the news, to keep engaged with our audience, to try to answer their questions. Um, you know, personally, because my background is in retail reporting, getting tons of um, questions about, you know, from small businesses, sort of the, the, the boutique version of what Jason's been doing for restaurants. Um, as an organization, you know, we are for the first time ever attempting to put together a print magazine remotely. We're all working from home right now, all in different places. Normally, um, even in 2020, we print out pages and we look at them and we pin them up on a wall and we're doing all of that virtually right now as a team. Everybody's in their, uh, respective homes working. Um, so kind of, you know, living in the, the immediate of what we need to do online and social, and then also trying to think about what a magazine should look like in May and in June and what we're gonna wanna be talking about then. Hey, thanks to you all for joining us again. Well, for those who are working in newsrooms, pressure's never been higher. News of the day is flowing in faster Reporters are on the front lines, often exposing themselves to the virus. And 70% of Americans, according to Pew Research, are reporting that they think media are doing a good job covering the story. Meanwhile, criticism is still loud from those who don't agree. So let's jump in and get started. Um, Jason, let's start with you. How has your newsroom changed the way it's operating just in a day-to-day -day way? So reporters and photographers are meeting in, uh, they're, they're meeting either in the field or in our garage. Uh, we are doing all our meetings uh, via Zoom right now, so nothing in person. Um, if someone does have to come back to the building, they go up there, all our sales team is at home, everybody's at home. Uh, so the logistics of news gathering is totally different. And we also have journalists who are you know, at different stages of comfort, just like all of us are at whether you're gonna go out and do an in-person interview with someone. Are you gonna go in the field? Are you gonna Skype? Are you going to FaceTime? How are you going to gather news? So everyone is at kind of a different phase of this. Some people are trying to work from their home uh, and gather information that way. And it's, it's uh, for us, it's very, very challenging. Uh, in the news, you have access to our entire archives, all our video, graphics, you can introduce all that stuff. 
well, we're a one-way operation. People in the field can send stuff in, but we can't send stuff out to them in the field. So that's been very challenging. Some of these things where you're, you're trying to, you know, uh, you're just trying to get the news on every day uh, have become more challenging for people who are concerned about their health, concerned about their safety, uh, concerned about their family. We have uh, our coworkers have the same struggles that everybody at every other business has, where you might have daycare concerns at home, you might have another person working. And so you're trying to do all of this stuff and the reality is our uh, news coverage is 100% uh, coronavirus. So, so the logistical challenges, you know, some of the stuff which to corporate America might seem easy, right? Like doing a, doing a video conference or doing a Skype. Uh, to us, you say, how do we get that into our system? How do we record that? How do we put that on the air? Uh, those have been things that people have had to learn sort of on the fly. Great. Jamie, when we talked yesterday, you also shared a little bit about how your day-to-day -day story selection is, has changed and how you're working with your newsroom. Yeah, it's been fascinating. Um, I, if people have been paying attention, CBS National Network was hit by the coronavirus pretty early. A couple of weeks ago, we had about six cases in the New York Broadcast Center. So a lot of what Jason's talking about um, with just changing our operations, suddenly we went from we send everything to New York to now nothing can be sent to New York, nothing can go through New York. Um, so Los Angeles, where I am, and DC have had to pick up um, a lot of those pieces and learn the technology. And um, we here in Los Angeles had, had taken in a lot previously, but to give you an idea, normally we cut for the evening newscast with Nora O'Donnell. We usually cut with editors two pieces a day in Los Angeles. Um, that's gone up some days to six. Um, so it's been very taxing on certain people, other people then working from home, having the stresses like Jason talked about. But, um, you know, primarily what's been interesting is that normally we're looking for stories, um, you know, impacting the national audience, right? Well, this is the one story that's impacting everyone in terms of the economy. Um, you know, as you're talking, I mean, we saw those jobless numbers today, I think were shocking to many of us and just how are we going to tell those stories from a national scale? Where is it hitting? Um, but I have currently 12,316 emails in my inbox and that's since um, Tuesday night, I tried to clear it out. So um, just the amount of traffic between coworkers and then businesses sending me ideas. Um, you know, I'm getting a lot of like, when you're out of COVID-19 coverage, how about we talk about it? That's, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm just not paying attention to those right now. Um, so if we have a personal relationship, like talk to me in a couple of weeks. Um, I think what's fascinating is like Allie was talking about having to look at this from her perspective months down the line. We seem right now to be day to day. How can we day to day get the coverage um, on television and day to day what's impacting people because the, from a national perspective, the amount of states keeps changing. You know, you went from 12 shelter in place states to 19. What does that mean? What does it mean for the economy and those types of things? So those are the types of discussions we're having. So what we're looking for, which I know a lot of people, um, I can see questions already coming in about that. I know at the national level, what we're looking for is, is your business hiring people? Um, because that's a huge problem right now. Uh, is your business providing a service that they normally wouldn't? Has your business turned from a clothing company to now making medical equipment? Um, I wanna hear about those types of things. I also, last night on the CBS Evening News, there was a story featured um, that I did, I Skyped the interview from my living room here, but it was on a local photographer in Minneapolis who's going around um, taking pictures at people's porches. So do you have a really good story of people giving back and kindness and um, those types of things? Because we're trying to balance out, you know, each of these broadcasts as well, while also having our own technological challenges. So if you are a business too, or if you're a business leader or somebody in PR, and you know that you have video materials available, you know that you have interviews already in the can that maybe you pre-produced um, that we can label, or you have people ready to go on Zoom or Skype that I can sit down with today and you know maybe do the interview today and it won't air for a couple days. If you can get people in place, have those other materials, pictures, that kind of thing, that's very helpful right now because we're just so handicapped um, at this point in time with not having our typical broadcast center. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's so helpful because we are getting a lot of questions in um, off to the side. If you wanna submit a question, 
just hit the Q&A button at the bottom and all of our panelists can see that. We'll either ask them the question or they can see the questions as they come in too and they'll work it into their conversation. But that's so interesting, you know, relation, we're always talking about how relationships and public relations are so important and, and now more than ever, apparently. Um, Allie, how have organizations, businesses changed the way they're sharing news? Um, I'll give you an example. At Toonheim, we're working with a client right now that had a, a big announcement plan that we were going to hold a press conference for. And now that shifted to be a virtual call where media can call in and get the information that way. Um, what else have you seen like this and what, what do you find is working well? Um, I mean, I think for the for the organizations that are really primary at the center of this places like Mayo Clinic, um, you know, they have been doing a really amazing job with everything on their plate of, you know, letting reporters know every day, we have an expert available for you at this time. This is what he or she can speak to. That's enormously helpful, you know, just knowing in advance that, you know, these are kind of the key calls, whether it's government or kind of essential functions, um, knowing when the call is, how to get there, who's going to be on the line, here's when you can ask questions, things like that. For everything else, um, you know, I guess it's really more of kind of case by case. If there was a business that said, we're going to do a virtual call, and I didn't know what it was right now, I don't know that we would, you know, um, put the resources toward that. I would kind of need to know in advance and, and figure out if it factors into our coverage today or if it's something we're going to really need down the road. One bright spot that I would say, I mean, for us, because I'm not, uh, you know, in the TV business, like um, the other two who need all the video, in some ways, it's actually been easier for us to reach people because everybody is at home on their computer. And we've had an amazing response rate um, reaching, you know, CEOs and heads of companies. And I just think there's this feeling that we're all in this together. Everybody wants to get the information out, whether it's about their company or something they're doing. And so for the purposes of written stories, we've actually been able to, to get the information we need pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Jason, have you seen any tactics um, that have been especially helpful from a broadcast perspective? Uh, you mean from the from the side of people trying to get stories on the air? Or? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, you, I also I dabble in both worlds. I I am also the food editor for Minnesota Monthly Magazine, and I had of course uh, four restaurant reviews ready to go for a man that comes out in four weeks, I think, three weeks. And we throw all of that out. I wrote a new essay. I quickly put to writing about Minnesota. We, we have three little digests in print. I typically have a big review, three many reviews. And we pivoted to writing about Minnesota food vendors uh, because people are at home and buying products to use in their kitchen. Uh, and actually, one of the local makers had emailed me with a long list of Minnesota, before I knew I was going to do this, but she had emailed me a long list of other Minnesota uh, small business owners where she was pitching that. And I thought, she's like, oh, I can get you all these products if you want to do on-air segments. And like, we're not quite ready to go back to on-air cooking segments yet. But I thought that was smart. It was a smart way of reaching out. And it was a relationship for sure. I did want to talk about uh, when we're going to be ready to go back to non-coronavirus stories. And I asked our assignment uh, manager what he thought on that. And he said, he's like, at least two weeks out, at least before those kind of stories coming back, especially as you look at the modeling that says we're, we're going to be hitting the peak of cases coming perhaps in, you know, we have a long way to go on this thing. So I think those stories aren't drying up. So the challenge for people trying to get placement is what are the things that you are doing to lift your community up? What are the things that your employees are doing to lift the community up? It's a time to do something that I've always told PR people is a really valuable way to get placement. And that is to pitch stories today that maybe have nothing to do with your company. And then I realize that you've pitched a good story. And now next time you email, you better believe I'm going to read it. If you send me a good story, now you're in. Like, that's the currency I care about. Pitch me a great story. And if it's not about you, okay, it's not about you today. But then when you come back with another great story that is about you, 
you know, that's one way to get into it. Business stories, like Ali said, are getting more time than ever woman on our, our show because people are interested to see how manufacturers are going from making pillows to making masks. Or we had a story from someplace in the middle of nowhere in Minnesota uh, that made uh, zip ties. Zip ties is what they know, like, uh, like twist ties for, for like bread bags and whatever. And they changed to making face masks. You're like, wow, how cool is that? So people are into those stories right now when normally like a lot of business type stories, it's difficult for me to get those on the air because they are perceived as being like a commercial for the business. Right now, it's more about what, I mean, that is the number one question. Assuming that none of you are doing things that are directly related to coronavirus. What are you doing to lift up the community, to make this better place, to make people feel good about life, about each other? Those are the things that we're, we're desperate for. Mm -hmm. And Jamie, you shared a little bit with me yesterday as well about, you, you get the question all the time, when will coverage turn away from COVID-19 and you'll be ready to cover other things? Will you share a little bit about the national perspective? Yeah, I think Jason just hit it right on. And that's true even at the national level. Um, Nora almost every day is talking about how we're all in this together. It's hitting New York and Los Angeles and you've seen Washington State, Louisiana and those types of places pop up right now. Um, as we start watching that curve and, and I, I think it's gonna be a long time. I think it could be a month or longer before we return to anything else besides COVID at the national level, just because as you're watching those peaks, I think people are gonna be paying attention as to where this is and where it's going. Um, and they're gonna want real-time information. It's also gonna be interesting if the federal government uh, reopens to business and if the president does get people back to work by Easter, as he had talked about, how does that, you know, what are the implications of that? Air travel, there are all these national topics that I think the first part of all the broadcasts are still gonna go into. Um, but if you do have those human interest stories, if you have somebody at your business who's doing something really great outside of work or has pivoted, we wanna hear those, there's still space for that. There's also space in the morning show, every day we're having guests on um you know they're looking for people like trevor trevor noah was on the morning show the other day not a typical morning show guest but he's trying to even he you know is trying to uplift people and do a show from instagram is your business trying to do something like that are they providing a service to people in a different way um there's d nice the dj out here that everyone's now heard about um who's doing dance parties you know even if you're not an artist is there somebody within your company who's doing things to lift people up or do something and as jason said i think this is a really opportune time to build relationships with us i know i've gotten a couple calls the last couple days where people have said to me hey you, we work together on this one project i have a teacher who's you know in desperate need of books for her learning tree could you at least social media that um, and maybe I can't do a full story on it, but I do have a reach in terms of social media and I could do that or I can give it to cbsnews.com. Um, I know our digital channel is trying to get back up and running that they were hit hard um, in New York. So there, there are places that the content can go to too, that if it's not, you know, if it can't make a full piece on the national broadcast, it can make other places within the national broadcast platform. Or the other thing is I being at the national level, we talk to affiliates all the time. So if you're somebody in Minnesota or Louisiana or Washington state, and you've watched something really work because COVID has hit you ahead of maybe some of these other places, let me know. And I can call our affiliate in Las Vegas or, you know, um, Washington DC or whoever and the local stations can maybe take it and then use it. So maybe you're not getting the national broadcast platform, but we have, you know, I think it's 20 some owned and operated stations, including WCCO that, um, you know, maybe not everything's getting filtered through to them. So there's different ways that you can connect and talk to us. And I think social media is a good place. I'm getting a lot of direct messages, um, you know, on Instagram and Twitter. And those grab my attention a little bit more right now than my email inbox, just because my email inbox seems to just be flooded with so much stuff. Um, so I've had a lot of people to reach out saying, you know, I used to I used to work with you when you were in Minneapolis, we did food segments together. Now I'm at this company doing this. Here's this product that we're doing. What do you think? And we're having conversations that way, which has been um, has been interesting. Um, 
you know, I'm taking a lot more phone calls than I ever have before. So, and I'm open to that. It's just, don't expect, if you've got some, something for June, July, or August right now, I think it's just too soon. I, we're just really focused on, you know, the immediate um, springtime and how this is impacting people and highlighting some of those personal stories. Great. And meanwhile, Allison, you're looking at June, July, and August right now. So if, we're, <laughs> if, if people are looking to pitch a story to you for those issues, what should they keep in mind? Um, it is so tricky, you know, I mean, it is, it is so, uh, everything is just so uncertain and we're all in the same boat, but, you know, predicting how much people are going to want to be reading, um, you know, about coronavirus in the late summer and knowing exactly what our world is going to look like is just really, really hard. And so um, we certainly have some stories in the pipeline that are not um, you know, totally, really, there's some that just were no longer relevant. I'll give you a really good example. Um, actually, our May cover story, um, which we basically had to rip up our May issue and kind of start over with, you know, a couple of weeks to spare. Um, we're in the final days now, but our May cover story was about downtown Minneapolis and the fact that, um, you know, we've hit this level of, um, you know, so many people living downtown where, where all the officials said, that's what we needed for vibrancy but there isn't any and the cover was going to be you know where are all the people and that was going to be about downtown <laughs> Minneapolis well a couple of weeks later it's a whole saying where are all the people is a whole different story so I mean you know it's just kind of looking for how do meanings change how you know anything that could be you know misconstrued how do we how do we move forward on things that maybe it's not going to be relevant this summer but there is going to be you know application going forward and so you just have to frame it up a little differently one thing we're doing because we're primarily business focused you know there are sectors that are really Really thriving right now. Um, you know, there are, you know, technology is a good example. They're very well equipped to work remotely. And it's actually a really great time to be innovative and thinking about new products and bringing things to market quickly. So we were able to quickly do a story about um, some new apps and companies that rushed things into production because everybody is home. It's kind of the business version of a you know feel good, pick me up story. So we're trying to do things like that. And um, if we are looking at things for the summer that are not you know, directly coronavirus related, you know, there's sort of broader, broader strokes and um, trying to be, you know, useful and informative when possible and bring in a lot of perspective of industry experts and where they think things are headed um, so that we can just, you know, help people as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Thanks. All right. With so much information coming into your newsrooms right now, how are you validating the information that's coming in and, and making sure that it's um, not misinformation? Jason, I saw you nodding your head. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're double and triple checking everything. We always do now, especially in this era of social media where so much information that comes in, uh, maybe someone trying to mess with you, maybe true or not. Uh, this is certainly our newsroom. Uh, it tends to be more conservative anyway. Um, we want to be first, but more importantly, we want to be right. So, you know, we're validating everything. Pictures that come in make me very nervous. People have a lot of time on their hands. There's a lot of time to Photoshop, who knows what. So, you know, before sharing, retweeting, even doing stuff socially, we are really vetting the sources. And, you know, I, I tend to play it more conservative and I'm generally going to, you know, on social, I'll retweet CBS News, WCCO, uh, political years I know. Um, but, you know, it is it is definitely a time to be, to have your guard, your guard up. And even when companies are sending information via email, you know, we found out, so we're, we launched this thing today about job openings. Our morning executive producer has been calling the companies to verify that press releases they sent out about, you know, we're Amazon, we're hiring 100,000 people. Okay, like how many are you hiring in Minnesota? Are you still hiring? Uh, so we are, we're, we're definitely, the guard is up, put it that way. Mm -hmm. Jamie, from a national level, how are you handling that? 
Well, I think sometimes people, you know, I mean, it's been it's been an interesting world the last few years, right, where everybody talks about fake news. But I'll tell you at um, CBS, the thing that I've always been proud of is that um, we have a system in place where, you know, we'll gather the information. Um, we have fact checkers on the payroll who sit all day and all they do is check facts um you know and we will send them if i'm in the field i'll send them a list of things that somebody said to me even people's names um their ages you know they're it, they will look into everything there's a huge team of people and beyond that we actually have an ethics um group who there's a team of five people so that morning noon and night they're not and then there's another layer of lawyers right um, so, but the ethics board every day, uh, we will send them information. Maybe like Jason said, I th think an interesting example is last night, there was some video going around of tanks being placed in California and some people started freaking out going, what is this video? Turns out it was from three years ago. Fact check was able to flag it immediately. Um, you know, and before publishing it to any, to the web or CBSN or anything, um, the ethics board was able to say, hold on, we need fact check mm -hmm. to make sure that this is real. Um, so we have many different layers. Of course, things can happen and go wrong. Um, but I think it, people are being very diligent. I think the one thing about people working from home that's been kind of interesting is that so many of our New York based producers um, who are so used to being in the broadcast center, we now seem to have another layer of eyes um, who normally are busy doing 18 million other things or talking to people all day that suddenly they're they're hyper focused um, and they're flagging things and saying, I don't know if this is true or can we can we make sure fact, you know, this gets to the top of fact check. Um, but, you know, the one thing that's difficult at a national level is just getting the overall numbers. So we have to go through too, you know, uh, when it comes to the number of cases, the number of sick, the number of dead, the number of tests, um, we're relying on the bigger institutions like John Hopkins or, um, you know, and then we also have three doctors on staff. We have Dr. David Agus, we have Dr. John LaPook, and we have Dr. Tara Narulo. And I know for myself, there's been a couple things that have that have popped up here um, in California, whether it's how long the virus can last on a surface or, um, you know, can you really go outside? I, and I've just typed it out to them, sent it to them, and they've either texted, called, um, or emailed me back pretty quickly because they as doctors want to make sure that we're getting the right information and facts out. I think that's why, um, you know, when there's been interest in the national level, I think people are turning to, to people like Dr. Anthony Fauci, you know, the people that are giving the straight facts of things. Um, so we have multiple layers in place to take care of some of that stuff. Something may slip through, but we're really just trying to, to stick to the, the people that are um, most known to be accurate and the sources of information that are are most known to be accurate. And, and fact check will call you if they think there's a mistake. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, a couple housekeeping points. We're getting some great questions in from those of you who are listening. If you'd like to submit a question for the panel, please click the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And uh, everyone who's participating on here will we'll get that question and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, also, we had a question about will the entire conversation be available later and yes, we'll, we're recording this conversation and we'll be making it available on Tunheim Facebook, LinkedIn and Instagram later today. Great questions. So Ali, you and I, when we were talking yesterday, you touched on a, a point about um, what permanent shifts are we going to see as a result of how we're working today? Um, uh, from, you know, I mentioned that we're doing a virtual media conference instead of an a in-person press conference. What other virtual shifts do you think could happen as a result of this? And, and that would be actually good. Yeah, um, I mean, that's something we're talking a lot about, especially looking at stories for a little bit further out. You know, you think about, we have a story on tcbmag.com uh, today about co-working. Um, you know, co-working an industry that's just been, you know, absolutely exploding nationally. What happens after this to, you know, fewer people freelancing, less disposable income, more concerns about 
germs? Does that slow down the pace? Does that slow down construction of co-working spaces? Those are some of the questions we're starting to ask, you know, thinking about, um, it's been amazing to see all of the um, gyms and health clubs, you know, so quickly jump into virtual classes. These are places that their entire business model was about bringing people together in a physical space. They kind of intentionally didn't offer virtual classes. Now they've got that up and running in a matter of a couple of days. You know, Lifetime told me within the first day of theirs launching, they had, you know, 50,000 um, downloads. So, you know, there's an appetite for it right now. Does that disappear when this is over? Or does that become a new revenue stream? Does that become an alternative for, mm -hmm. for a lot of people? So, you know, it's early days and right now it's all speculation, but those are kind of some of the broader things we're, you know, starting to, to think about. Mm -hmm. Jason, what permanent well, we, shift do you think? Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at this from two different ways. One from my TV hat, the other from my restaurant reviewer hat. From the TV hat, uh, you know, in this country, we have talked about working from home for so long. And so many managers are not comfortable unless they can see their minions and be like, he's working, she's working. Well, working from home is going pretty well for a lot of companies. And I think there is an incredible societal implication if even 5% of the people who are working from home stay home. Mm -hmm. think, about, think about how much we talk about transit and we talk about uh, bicycling it would be the single largest impact we could have on pollution, on the environment. It would be an absolute sea change if five, imagine 10%. Now also it would devastate downtowns, right? It would completely change the way we do commerce, the change the way we report to work. But I think what we're seeing is like, hey, some people could work in the middle of the night if you're an insomniac and some people could work eight to four. Yeah, hey, good news for Jamie. I have someone to text with in the early morning. I mean, so these are the things. From the restaurant side uh, and the food writing side, um, you know, will people want to be jammed in close to each other in a restaurant? Is social distancing going to become a permanent thing that'll be in the back of our head? Maybe it will. We've seen talk, we've seen a shift towards the QSR model, the, quick service restaurant, kind of the Chipotle type thing. But in Minnesota, we've been real slow on that. We've seen full service, still like plenty of pizza places that you can have a server come over and bring you your drinks. You know, I think when, when the restaurants, you know, we'll, we'll see if their restaurants are gonna be closed here till May 5th. Uh, a lot of these places are not going to be able, you know, we, we have nice programs to help them defer their payments and stuff, but like, are you gonna be able, when you go to reopen, the landlord's gonna need to pay their mortgage. So you're gonna have to pay two, three months of rent or utilities or whatever. A lot of places aren't gonna be able to open. Uh, that's bad, but what will be built? You think if you had some institutions in this country that you just tore down, and then if you were to build it new, knowing where we are as a society today, how would it be different? I don't know, like I wish it were not happening, but it does open your mind to think like, gosh, who knows what things will look like when we get back. And maybe nothing will change. Inertia is a pretty powerful uh, factor here. And, and so maybe I'm, most things will be the same. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Jamie, as someone who travels all the time for work, what, what permanent shifts do you see? Well, I think that's, you know, our, the president of my company keeps saying that we are creatively adapting um, and we are, I mean, doing things from our apartments and our houses and, um, you know, it, with our own little kits has been fine for now. I think there is still, when things start kind of getting back to normal, there will be a demand for the quality of having a photographer and the audio quality. I don't think some of those things will go away. Um, but maybe maybe we don't have as big a problem if someone wants to shoot something on their own. You know, there's also labor laws and, and unions and things that they'll have to figure out how they're going to get around some of that. But I think it's opening up the idea of how what what is the best quality that we could still put on network 
television. Um, to Jason's point, I think what's interesting is if businesses, I think those are the types of stories actually at a national level we're looking for. Are businesses pivoting to a different model? Are they gonna let a certain percentage of people work at home? Um, are they gonna give up the lease? Are landlords foreclosing on places? Those are the stories that we at the national level wanna hear. So if those things are taking place from a business sense, I think that that could have national implications. Do downtowns change? Do traffic levels change? How does that impact the environment? Those are all storylines that I think, um, you know, for the people that are watching and listening that we would be interested in. And you can start talking about that as a corporation of how you're changing things. I thought, you know, I pay attention to Minneapolis has been um, a big talking point at the national level in terms of 3M, Honeywell, Target, you know, a lot of these, all of a sudden people went, I didn't know these places were all based in Minneapolis. It's like, I've been yelling about this forever, but okay. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, so I think it's, I think people are paying closer attention to where our big companies are and how many people are employed and how they do go to work. Um, so those will all be, be storylines and things too. I think selfishly, I hope I still get a photographer who can light me because it's going to take a whole lot more makeup and, you know, uh, living out here in LA, like some cosmetic surgery to keep, uh, keep the good looking <laughs> stuff going on. Um, somebody just asked a question of what lighting I use. It's a Movo, M-O-V-O that we, a uh, little package we got offline. But right now, um, one tip and trick I did learn from the photographers in my life, including my brother, is that natural light works very well. So I'm sitting with the natural light coming in on the window right now. So a little tip, if you want, uh, if you're doing Zoom meetings and you wanna look a little bit better, sit in front of a window and have the light come to you. Yeah. As we speak, a reporter at TCB is putting together a list of Zoom hacks and what <laughs> all of the uh, business leaders are doing to look their best and utilize all the functions in Zoom. I mean, talk about a company that is, you know, has become so important and is now, you know, a verb that we're all using. How many people mm -hmm. knew about Zoom a few weeks ago? It's a much smaller group. Right. A lot of things have shifted. Um, and, you know, I keep hearing you all talk about relationships, which is when people, when our team, we have new people start at Toonheim, that's what we start with is you, you need to build, build relationships with the media you're going to be working with. Um, Jason touched on this, not just when you're looking for them to cover a story, but also when you just see a good story that they might want to cover. Um, one of, so knowing that if people are listening today and they don't have those relationships, and they think they do have a good COVID related story that they'd like to pitch right now. Um, how, what, what are your tips for, for how they should go about that? For example, Troy jumped in with a question about, he's got some, um, they're creating videos for children so that you know it can help entertain them while they're at home, which so many families are struggling with right now. Um, how should he go about pitching that story, that good news story, or just a business related story? Uh, I would, yeah, I would say for our newsroom, uh, a lot of it is the same as always. Like uh, the main assignment desk is just getting hammered with tips, hammered with stories. Um, but like the way it works in our newsroom is we have a main email that tips at WCCO.com. And that goes out to a bunch of people, assignment editors, certain managers. I don't know. Thank God I'm not on that email list. I don't need that. Uh, I don't need it. Um, when people send me a direct email, I'm still reading all of those emails. Um, I, I will say one trend I've noticed over recent years is the fancier the email, the more I assume it's from a national PR person and uh, tend to be more likely to accidentally delete it. Um, <laughs> I'm on a food list, so I get all sorts of pitches for weird, like national, like do a, test out our frozen enchiladas. I'm like that is not at all what I do, but yes, sure, great. So uh, in the subject heading, if you can write like Minnesota, Wisconsin, that's helpful for me to know it's a local story. Um, and otherwise, like I'm trying to extend the same grace to PR people that I uh, hope people would extend to me right now, where I don't care if like the mail merge screws up and it says, hi, Bob, instead of hi, Jason. You're like, everybody's doing their best right now. Like, so that sort of stuff doesn't bother me. But like a direct email, a direct note, 
on social media, I will say, and some of this is my own fault, but I have so many social media channels going right now and trying to gather like information from restaurants and now trying to gather job postings that if you hit me up on social media, the best thing you can do is say, hey, I'm going to send you an email and then send me an email because I just can't keep track of all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Great. But going directly to a reporter, my strategy, if I were a PR person, I would always hit up the most junior reporter at a TV station if I don't know anybody because they have no sources. They don't know anybody and they desperately need to come into a meeting with story ideas. So that's who I would go after first. Like people always go to like our most senior reporters, like don't send Pat Kessler or Esme Murphy your pitch. Like they're covering the legislator and politics. You know, go to the kid that nobody knows who you can make look like a hero at the news meeting. Like that's the best way to go. That's a great tip. Uh, Jamie, we just got a great question from Dan Debon. And I think that so many of the PR and marketing people can benefit from this. And it's something you're dealing with every day. His question is, when you're interviewing someone over Zoom or Skype, what tips or advice would you have for spokespeople to make it a better remote interview? What kind of lighting should they use? Any preference of Zoom versus Skype? What do you have to say? Um, so <laughs> this was funny because every, every correspondent is doing something different because we've all been left to our own devices now in our own apartments and homes as to how we're going to go about shooting some of these. Um, I actually have two cell phones, which a lot of people do now. Um, and I take one of them and set it up and try different angles of what looks good to you before you get on some of these calls, right? Um, the other thing is lighting is a big thing, you know, like, I don't even know if I can try, but like, if I, if I go to my kitchen, you know, like, what's the background gonna look like? What's distracting? I today just wanted to have something fun in the background. If I was doing a straight news interview, I'd probably go to one of my other walls, but then, you know, you have to think about color, you know, is something cool? Is it warm? What are you wearing? Is it distracting? Like some of the tips in television that I've gotten as a woman over the years are solid colors, jewel tones. Um, if that's something that you're trying to present, you know, on camera. Um, and that's, that's, you know, the, that's how the interviews are going to go. I think a, br a bright color against a pretty plain background. If you have a bookshelf or a home office or something like that, where it's not too distracting, like Luann, I think you're doing a great job this morning of, of popping off of, you know, that's that you've got some contrast in terms of color and stuff like that. Um, but you know, you just don't want it to be too dark. You don't want things that are too distracting. Like I actually, this would be a no probably of um, a bright painting in the background. Um, but it's, you know, you just have to think about if you're trying to get your message across, what's the least distracting amount of stuff? Jewelry that, you know, the, another rule I've always heard over the years is when you look in the mirror, take whatever, um, and Allie probably from Allie, doing Allie shops, this might be a piece of advice she's given people. So they always say, take off two accessories. There's usually two too many. So like I have short hair, I generally stick to earrings, sometimes a necklace. Um, but that's it. And then, you know, you have to just think about, think about your hair. Like, do you want your hair in your face or do you want your hair off your face? Like how are you going to present, um, what's the image that you're looking to present? And also, you know, I think right now, like I'm, I'm in a sweatshirt, I'm home today and I'm talking uh, to you guys, but if I was to do an interview, I would still get dressed up. You know, I'd still, if you're a guy, I'd still put on a suit and tie, take it seriously. If you're a female, I'd put on, you know, a dress and some earrings and uh, makeup and that kind of stuff. I think, I think still taking the look seriously, even though you're in your home is a big thing and just trying to figure out the least distracting um, background and making sure you're not blowing out the color of your face, but also that it's not too dark. Great advice from the experts. Um, okay, we got a gr another great question from the attendees and we have a couple minutes left. So if you have additional questions you'd like to, to ask, just click your Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, Jason, let's, let's toss this one to you. What is one thing you wish you could have done in hindsight a few weeks ago to set you up better in this new news environment? Mm. Well, I would have, I probably would have a little uh, set up in my own home, like to, to be ready to go. Um, uh, you know, we, we actually did a fair amount of conversation about this. Because uh, not that we saw it, 
that this was coming, but you know, you could tell that the potential for something was coming. So we really did, we really did talk about, you know, I, I told my boss that I would, if we got to a shelter in place type situation that like, are you set up where I could sleep at the TV station? I'm like, I would be at the TV station. I had that conversation with my family as well, that I would be, they're like, we know. Oh, goodness. <laughs> you think Alyssa was surprised by that? No. 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 <laughs> She, she knows. Um, but, you know, these are different conversations for different people. So many of my coworkers have never covered any sort of disaster before. And so they've never covered a bridge collapse like we had in Minneapolis or 9-11 or any of those things. So for a whole generation of journalists, uh, who, who, you know, this is different. It's different for them. And so those kind of things, I think, are, are challenging. I think for sure we now know we all need backups. We need backup plans. We need backup studios. We need to be able to broadcast from home. Like for example, our newsroom computer system, um, computer that I have at home uh, is too old. And it, so I don't really have a computer that would allow me to get into our newsroom system. And frankly, most of my coworkers are in the same boat, even the people working from home. So like they're emailing scripts in, it's just not very efficient. So I think that is an interesting that all organizations are going to have to look at. To my boss's credit, it's something she's been talking about since she started at our station. And I think she probably has a lot more juice now to make that case uh, than at the beginning. But I don't know. I feel there's not a ton that I, w I, I would do differently. I probably wouldn't have gone out to dinner a week ago Saturday night. Yeah. I think looking back, like, you know, and I, I decided to. And, and wrote about it that I decided to stop going to restaurants before they closed the restaurants down. And I took some heat for that. So what are you going to do? What about you, Allie? What do you wish in hindsight you would have done a little differently? Well, I would say on our team at TCB, we had some um, Slack and Zoom resistors <laughs> and that everybody was really, you know, totally set up and equipped. I mean, we were very much divided. We've got, you know, some people who love nothing more than to work remotely and can do everything at home and others who want nothing to do with that. So, um, you know, it took a couple of days just to get everybody on the technology and up to date. Um, our help desk has been amazing amazing and, you know, making sure that everybody had access to, you know, remote logins to our, you know, to the back end of our websites and for to move files around. Um, I think we're still, we're actually just now hitting our, what we call pre-press when we get another magazine ready uh, to go to the printer. And so, you know, we really had to sort of invent new ways of like flagging files to make sure that there aren't two people in it at the same time and that we know what the most recent issue, you know, addition is. And so those are just things we hadn't had to think about before because we've always still had the office as a home base. Um, so, you know, it, everybody has responded very quickly and, and you know, we're gonna get the magazine out on time, but, um, but definitely does, um, present some challenges. Another thing for us that was sort of tricky, and again, we reacted quickly, our magazine gets delivered to a lot of offices. We're a business magazine. A lot of people receive it at their office, and all of a sudden we went, uh-oh, our April issue was due to land on Monday at a lot of closed doors. And we actually have something, technology that I've always really not liked, which is this like page turn pro it's this kind of pdf version of the magazine and i always thought oh that looks so old and who would want to read a magazine that way well guess what it's been a saving grace because now we can tout it as you know a virtual magazine experience from home and people actually have time to read it and so it's not something that we've really played up in the past we've just sort of had it as a record for those who want it we sent out a special email we're you know playing it up on the website and really you know telling people go to the virtual magazine to have the full magazine experience if you can't get your hands on a print issue. So it's just kind of quickly pivoting like every other business yeah. is doing. Mm -hmm. All right, let's do a round of shout outs to businesses that are doing it really well right now and why they're doing it well. A couple of you mentioned Mayo Clinic is one that's doing a great job. Um, who has some, that, some other examples of businesses that are doing a really good job right now and what they're doing that's working? Uh, I'll say I, Kroger out here, the grocery store chain, uh, has been very good about allowing us access. You know, that, that was such a big, um, 
I think, moment of panic for people because California went into a shelter in place before a lot of other places. Um, just getting the word out about you'll still be able to get your groceries. We're social distancing. We're only allowing a certain number of people in the store. And I know a lot of national grocery chains, I think, were really good about getting out their senior hours um, and that type of thing. Um, I think a lot of restaurants here, at least, have been very good about blasting, letting people know that they're still open for takeout um, or delivery options. A lot of people waiving fees. You know, I've, I think Uber and um, like Uber Eats and some of the other Grub Hubs, those, you know, blasting people saying that they, they've they waived some of that stuff. I at the Just from a California impact out here, I think that they were very much on top of getting that out. Um, you know, the, the governor kind of surprised people last Thursday, put the shelter in place in by Friday, which was very different than New York that had kind of a weekend to get everything up and running. And I'd say some of the big businesses out here seem to be ready to go with their messaging and what they were going to do. So, I, you know, a lot of the, the technology companies, I think, used what they had and, um, you know, were able to blast people pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Jason, um, Allie? Which are? Oh, I Go mean, ahead. I would say um, Target um, and Best Buy too, but I mean, you know, with two big retailers that, you know, have been on the front lines, I mean, Target especially, they've been excellent in their communications and sending things out and having all of their materials online, including, you know, things that might seem superfluous, but we can't post an online story without a photo. And sometimes that'll hold something up, you know, we'll have a good, you know, a, a story we need to report, but we've got to go track down a photo of, you know, the front of a store or whatever, or business, whatever it is. Is. So just having all the materials at the ready um, and sending out alerts and letting, you know, letting the media know in advance what is coming, super, super helpful. Um, you know, a smaller company, um, Stratasys is a, is a company we wrote about recently. They're a 3D printing company. They were one of the first over the weekend to say they're going to use their 3D printers to make face masks. They, they had all the information ready. They had links to, you know, um, where they're getting the directive, um, you know, from the government, what the, you know, what's necessary they had photos, they made it really easy for us to, to jump on that. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the government actually here has done a pretty good job, the state of Minnesota, as far as communicating and sending out uh, multiple communications about what's going on, what to expect, recaps. Like uh, normally I, I wouldn't say the government is the best at communicating, but uh, this, uh, I thought through this here in Minnesota, they've, they've been very, very good. Well, good. We're almost out of time. So thank you to you all for um, sharing part of your very always busy days, but especially now busy days with us. One of our um, participants, Erin Noel, shared a comment that I think just sort of sums it up. She says, as a PR person and a news consumer, thank you to all our news media who are making tremendous sacrifices to continue to bring us accurate, up-to-date news, helping to promote how we as the public can help our neighbors and um, sharing stories of hope during this incredibly uncertain time. Well, nice. thank you. I've That's actually found those messages almost overwhelming because for the last few years, it's been really tough to be a journalist uh, out in the field um, with different attitudes about things. And so to finally feel that people are paying attention, it, it really truly um, means a lot to me. So thank you to those who see that we, we do try to provide a service and, and give information and facts um, and we're doing our best and we're trying to live through this time too. So thank you. Yeah. And I want to also say thanks to our team at Toonheim who made this possible today. Nick Marcoulier, Joshua Carter, and Maddie Renicky. Uh, I want to remind you Toonheim is hosting complimentary office hours every day for the next few weeks by appointment to discuss your organization's challenges. So you can click the links that Nick has been providing along the side panel if you're interested in that. A recording of this virtual panel will be available later today on Toonheim social channels, uh, on Instagram and LinkedIn and Facebook. And then you can also follow us there for notifications of vir future virtual panels, just like this one that we'll be planning. Thank you and for Allie joining Jason, us today. When can we do happy hour? Right, exactly. <laughs> and, and <laughs> any virtual happy hour. Pants optional. Yeah. <laughs> happy hour for me Good. starts right about now. So what are we, what are we talking about? Right. All right, well, be well, stay home, and uh, stay safe. Thank you. All right, thanks, everybody.